hello everyone. I'll begin by introducing myself. I'm Marilyn McDonald and I'm a faculty member in the School of Nursing at Dalhousie University and the director of our JBI Evidence Synthesis Center in the school. And you'll see the name of our center on this slide just to the left of Dalhousie University. Um, and um, this is the 2023 edition of the JBI Global Solution Room. And we are hosting today's event in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And we are all treaty people. I realize many people joining us may be uh, in other um, unceded territories. And um, so, Today's session is going to open with um, a brief video, probably between three and four minutes. And actually the executive director of JBI Worldwide, Dr. Joey Zordon, Zoe Jordan. <laughs> um, and this same video will be played at all participating centers um, around the globe. I believe there are 35 um, local solution rooms that are happening over the next few days. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to move right into the video because the information in it, um, I don't need to repeat. And then following the video, um, there will be panel introductions. And so I will, uh, Dr. Lori Weeks is our moderator. So the introductions will begin with Dr. Weeks and then the uh, remaining panelists will introduce themselves and then we'll move into the discussion. So um, on to the video. Hello and welcome to the JBI Global Solution Room. This is an event that's really designed to engage clinicians in getting evidence into practice. For those of you who perhaps aren't familiar with JBI, we really are all about getting evidence into practice. So using the best evidence to get good outcomes and create a brighter future. Now recently, in recent years, I've been thinking a little bit um, about this idea of a flywheel effect. And the original concept came from a guy called Jim Collins. And what Jim talks about is the fact that organisational change never really happens in one fell swoop. Um, you know, there's no magic bullet, there's no solitary lucky break. It's about having consistent attention um, to something to, to drive change and, you know, to make organisational change happen. And I really felt like this has got some um, useful synergy with evidence-based healthcare and the forces that drive the successful translation of evidence into practice. Hopefully, most of you are familiar with the JBI model. Um, and we've recently published a paper about an, the idea of an evidence-based healthcare flywheel. Um, and what we did when we redeveloped the model in 2019 was to add these, we call them overarching principles, but they're, they're underneath, so they're kind of foundational principles um, around culture, communication, collaboration and capacity. And really we see these as the catalytic mechanisms that are required to successfully drive forward evidence-based healthcare initiatives in organisations. Now we certainly recognise that evidence-based healthcare is relational, it's not transactional. And if we, if we want to empower people to change their behaviour, then we really need to give some careful, thoughtful and consistent attention to navigating the, the relational matrices that, that organisations um, are run by. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel, we just want to get it moving. And so, as you can see by this um, graphic, we really feel like those four Cs that we added um, several years ago to the model uh, are the drivers of the momentum required to get evidence into practice. And I think that's a really important focus area that we probably haven't paid sufficient attention to. Um, we don't talk about them very much, we don't articulate them, but we know that they are the things that, that require attention in order to see change happen successfully. 
So I'm really excited that this week we have 35 local events happening. Now you have to remember that this is an event that started as the local solution room here in Adelaide um, a few years ago. And really it was just an effort um, on our part to re-engage with stakeholders across South Australia. But when we shared the concept with our international collaborations, they were really excited by it. And so over the years, we've seen the number of events um, grow, and now we have an extraordinary number of events happening, which is just so exciting for us to see. Um, we know that change can happen with just one pebble, with just one person. And so um, we're excited to see the ripple effect of change that came out of that one event. And we're excited to see the ripples that will now flow across the world. I hope that whatever event you're participating in um, this week, that you have a really enjoyable time. And I look forward to hearing more about them. Thank you. I would like to introduce Dr. Laurie Weeks, who's going to moderate our session. And uh, first of all, uh, Laurie will introduce herself and then um, you'll get to meet the rest of the panelists. So uh, Laurie, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, I'm joining you today from Ontario. I am at some meetings in London, Ontario at Western University, um, but I'm very happy to join all of you today. So I'm Lori Weeks and I'm a professor in the School of Nursing at Dalhousie and have been a, a member of a JBI Centre of Excellence at Dalhousie. I'm also um, involved in training um, and teaching the um, Comprehensive Systematic Review Training Program. So I've been enjoying doing that. We're just gearing up to start the um, um, program um, just to, um, tomorrow, actually, <laughs> we'll be beginning. Um, and so we're excited to be able to finally offer it in person <laughs> and also virtually for those who want to connect with us virtually. So um, I'm going to, um, I have a, we have some questions for our panelists and I'm going to um, invite each of the panelists to first of all, introduce themselves. And um, our first question is to, um, Tell tell um, everyone how you became involved in this particular type of partnership. So I think we'll just start there. So inter please introduce yourself and tell us how you became involved. And I will start with Elliot, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Laurie. <clears throat> and Thank you, Marilyn, as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> I'm Elliot Paz Jensen, and I am a community um, advocate for older adults and age-friendly communities um, <clears throat> I, and public patient partner. And I live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. So <clears throat> I've often been asked, how did you become involved in a, a research project in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, at Dalhousie University, which is three quarters of a continent away? Well, <clears throat> my uh, long-time advocacy work on behalf of older adults involves some participatory research. That plus my experience as a, as a social worker in healthcare, um, working with older adults in geriatric assessment unit, um, I uh, have seen the need for change in the healthcare system and I <clears throat> was not successful in getting changes going when I was working there. And that hmm, research, and th that is very, very important. And so I, I became involved with the SPORE Evidence Alliance, um, which is a national group, as, as you know. Um, there, I submitted um, a topic for research when the Alliance asked for patient partners to put a, a topic forward, um, and that was uh, care in institutions or care at home for older adults. And my topic was selected um, for funding. Um, <clears throat> this wonderful group at Dalhousie put forward a pr proposal, which I liked very much, <clears throat> and here we are. So did you want us to talk now, Laurie, too, about how it aligns with our values? Um, I think we'll wait. Yeah, we'll wait for that. Sorry. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, Elliot. Good. Um, okay. It's always oh, over to the next. 
Okay. <laughs> it's always interesting how, how people got involved in these things. Okay, we'll go next to Anne Bellavo, please. So introduce yourself, please, and tell us how you got involved in this type of partnership. Thank you, Lori and Marilyn, and, and thank you, Dr. Moody, for giving me this opportunity to be part of this group. It's been a very rewarding and exciting journey. My name is Anne Bellavo, and I'm one of the public partners in Dr. Um, Moody's research, and I came to be involved because my mom had dementia and ended up in the hospital for over a month with a terminal uh, cancer diagnosis. And during the time that she was in the hospital, um, I spent every day advocating for her care, for her safety, for her nutrition, for mobilization, um, just to um, and uh, mostly for communication, effective communication, um, because mom would often give <laughs> different answers than what were true um, when she was asked medical questions. So as a result of her being in the hospital, I um, wrote a letter to the Chronicle Herald and asked, had a wish list um, for some changes in healthcare for taking care of people with dementia. And one of my wishes was to see better education for all hospital staff when um, interacting with people with dementia and with the caregivers. So I saw um, Dr. Moody speak at one of the Alzheimer's uh, conferences. I'm an, an active volunteer with the Alzheimer's Society and her, her talk was very exciting and I approached her after um, her talk and asked if there was any research going forward that she was involved in could I please be part of it? And I was lucky enough that she brought me into her research and um, it's been very rewarding ever since. Wonderful, thank you very much, Ann. So that's a really nice segue into inviting Dr. Elaine Moody to introduce herself and tell us how you became involved in this type of work. Sure, so I'm uh, Elaine Moody. I'm a faculty member in the School of Nursing. Um, here at Dalhousie University. Really delighted to be here with Elliot and, and Anne to talk about um, public engagement in, in review specifically. Um, my background is as a nurse um, and I have an interest in um, supporting people with dementia, um, frailty and other complex um, health and social um, circumstances. Um, so really what brought me to this type of research in, in terms of public engagement, um, in part it was my experience as a nurse and, and uh, as a healthcare provider, um, seeing interventions that were not um, tailored to the needs of providers. Um, and then also um, the IT folks are, are, are just showing up. Um, and the second piece is, is working with people with dementia and older adults. I was really aware that um, historically they've been included from, from research and from policy development and uh, design of healthcare, um, healthcare settings. Um, so from early on in my research training, I really um, had a priority on, on um, giving a voice to, to people that have traditionally been um, excluded from research. So um, I, I do try to have members of the public engaged in, in most of my, my research and, and teaching as well. Wonderful, thank you. So I'll just do it. I'm, I'm moderating and kind of part of the panel too. So as we have time, I'll, I'll put a little bit of information in there. So um, I'm a gerontologist and a social scientist and not a nurse, but have a wonderful academic home in the School of Nursing at Dalhousie University. And my research is on the care and support of older adults and supporting their caregivers as well, their family and friend caregivers. And my interests are the entire array of services and supports for older people and caregivers from community-based services and home care and support to um, supporting people in, in residential long-term care facilities. <clears throat> and one of the, the large teams that I am um, a part of is called TREC. Um, it's called, it's um, an acronym for Translating Research in Elder Care, and it's led by Dr. Carol Estabrooks, who is a, a faculty member in nursing at the University of Alberta. 
and there's researchers all across Canada and also in many countries of the world that are affiliated with that research. And the focus of it is on improving the, the quality of life of people living in residential long-term care homes or nursing homes, and also improving the quality of work life of people who work in these settings. Um, it's been a, 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 a program of research that's been ongoing. I think they are now in the seventh wave of data collection, which is really quite impressive. And I'm also part of the Atlantic team. So led by Janice Keefe at Mount St. Vincent University in the Nova Scotia Center on Aging there. Um, she's received um, a large grant to really extend the work that was mostly based in Western Canada um, to continuing that work in the Atlantic provinces. So that's really exciting and we're kind of um, gearing up to be doing more of that work and supporting quality of um, long-term care in, in Eastern Canada. So um, that's a little bit about um, kind of what I'm going to be talking about, but in particular, um, there is a group called Voices. It's part of this large team. And Voices is a really, really integral part. So what it is, is a, a group of um, interested citizens. It, the acronym really is about Voice of Residents and Caregivers Educating Us. That's the official name of the Voices group. And <clears throat> at all team meetings, large and small, virtual and face-to-face, -face, um, members of the Voices team are, are part of the group. and. Um, Carol has a very strong implementation science background and citizen engagement has been a very, very important part of this program of research. So I'll be reflecting a little bit on some of the things that I've observed and learned from that process of being engaged in a very large program of research that's included many, many different types of research from randomized controlled trials to, you know, many, many student led projects for their own research. Um, and systematic review work as well. So um, that's a little bit about what I'll be putting in a little bit of information about into this particular discussion. So the next question for the group, and I'll go back to um, to start over with Elliot, um, to talk a little bit about how this type of work um, aligns with your, your goals, your objectives, um, your priorities, and what you see as the benefits of doing this kind of work in relation to your own goals? Well, <clears throat> Laurie, I was very interested in, in what you, you had to say, uh, particularly the last part about voices, because <clears throat> elevating the voices of older adults who are generally not heard and really dismissed in, often in, long in um, healthcare um, and not heard in research is very important to me. And, um, being involved as an older adult, as someone in their 80s, uh, it, it's it's sort of fun to be part of that, um, to to be doing that, and it's very important too because it, it it we should not be on the side. We are the group that's affected by it. So that that is really part of my goal um, and priorities. But really, very personally to me, that is this this particular research research. When I was working, I met many people who had no choice no option at all but to move out of their homes into a residential setting in order to get the care they need. This is at a time in their lives where they were obviously dealing with very with a huge amount of stuff. Um, many, many problems and issues as with their families. Uh, they were, uh, the pain was huge. The cost of this, this move, making this transition was just enormous. And as a social worker, I was often privy to that, the, how they were feeling. It has mattered greatly to me over the years. And um, so to be part of this particular research, which is looking at the effectiveness of programs in the community for uh, older adults with ongoing complex health and social care needs um, is, is just, it's very meaningful. It's a, it's a very big priority for me. And I feel privileged to be part of it. Okay, thank you very much, Elliot. Okay, Anne, would you like to address how this involvement aligns with your goals, objectives, and priorities, and, and benefits? Um, I already, yes, thank you. <laughs> I did mention <laughs> earlier um, one of my goals was to see um, education improved for hospital staff, um, and this project 
is the backbone of finding out how that can be done. It's been very gratifying um, to see when you're when you're in that situation, you're in a very dark place and you're not seeing all of the good things. By doing this systematic review and being part of this team, it allowed me to see the research that's going on all over the world and, and the changes that people are trying to make. And and there there is a strong focus on um, listening to all the voices and and that's that's really nice to see. So right now it's aligning. Um, it's it's giving me the experience to see where to go next, <laughs> and you know, and and the backbone of of what is being done already. Okay, great, thanks, Anne. Okay, we'll go on to Elaine then to address our second bullet point here. I think you can all see it on the screen. Yeah. Um, thank you, Elliot and Anne for for that perspective. Um, and I guess just for some context for um, those watching, um, Elliot and Anne are involved in two different projects and kind of mentioned the one related to um, dementia care and hospital. Um, and Elliot spoke a little bit about uh, another project, which is looking at uh, community support for older adults with complex needs. Um, really looking at complex interventions as alternatives for long-term residential care. Um, and, and both projects are uh, systematic reviews. One's a mixed methods review and the other is a, um, a review of effectiveness. Um, so in terms of my goals, I, I see both of these projects and these reviews um, really as as Anne alluded to providing the foundation for for further work um, so understanding what the the current um, body of knowledge is um, looking at where gaps are um, looking to see if there's any promising practices that can be um, included in um, future healthcare improvement um, so that's really uh, the big focus is um, um, seeing what's happening now, getting a good understanding of the, um, the state of the evidence um, so that future research and, and practice guidelines can be uh, improved. Okay, thank you, Elaine. So what I would add to this statement um, really kind of is a historical factor for me. Um, I finished my PhD in 1998, so it's quite a while ago now. And at that time, these concepts really were not in, in, embedded nearly as much or really at all um, when I was in my training. So the idea of a researcher, um, you know, what you're going to study, whether you're a student or a faculty member, it, it wasn't about <laughs> really listening to to needs of people living in the community or, or, or whatever stakeholder group that might be. It just simply wasn't taught. It was really more about what do we already know in the literature? What is of interest to you as a as a person? Um, we just really, you know, didn't do we didn't really do this at that time. And I've been really pleased that over my career that, you know, um, research has really changed for me because I really kind of went from a person who was like, OK, well, we spend all of this time and energy um, doing this work and we publish it and very few people read it and then we publish more and you know it just never felt very meaningful to me so I really um, find that today when we work more closely with um, citizens who are affected by these this research we do um, the questions that we ask really the priorities really come from the people who would be affected by this work. And to me in general, um, it makes research more meaningful and more impactful when it's not just the researchers <laughs> sitting in a room thinking, oh, this is what I think we should do. Um, so it is just kind of a, a long term historical impact of the utility of research. We still have to do the publications, but it's also I find very rewarding to um, you know share findings in multiple ways and not just those academic reports but 
you know, sharing them in, in more ways that are useful to people. <laughs> and the citizens that we've worked with in different projects are very helpful in terms of, you know, what kind, how, what is, what do the results mean and how can it, how can the work be most useful? So to me, that's kind of why I'm, I really enjoy um, doing work where we engage members of the public with them, um, with doing research of all, all sorts, including systematic reviews. Okay, well, so I think mm -hmm. it's Marilyn uh, listening to you and talking sort of uh, thinking about the origins of patient engagement made me think about um, the work of a faculty member at Western um, who did participatory action research with people living with mental illness. And I can remember reading that work many years ago, and this person made a conscious decision that they could, could not continue to do research without the people that were living with mental illness as part of it because it wasn't it just wasn't getting the traction and so um hence the idea was born but in doing participatory action research it can't be done without um, the individuals that are living with whatever the um, phenomenon is and uh but not everyone does participatory action research and how wonderful it is now that the patient engagement movement um, came into being. And uh, I, I, I've been fortunate to be part of projects where we have that, that um, engagement and it's very enriching. And um, I want to think and I know that we'll get better and better at working together so that the, the uh, what we what we generate really has the relevance and um, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It's um, been really interesting to have this perspective over time, you know, that Marilyn and I have been able to have. Elaine is a newer academic and doesn't hasn't been an academic as long, but um, you know that nothing without about us without us is definitely a mantra that a lot of older adults that I've worked with over the years really um, take to heart. And yeah, so it is good to have seen this evolve and develop to where we are now. Um, but there are some issues and challenges in doing this kind of work, and that's kind of what the next part is. Um, so we'll go back to Elliot. <laughs> what have you learned about working? in this type of partnership and, and what are some of this you might have talked about some of the strengths or but may, might not have talked about some of the challenges maybe of doing this right no i think he spoke beautifully about the strengths and really said what i saw, saw as the strengths and and from a historical perspective as a patient partner as well i should just mean i just like to mention too that when i was first involved in participatory re research and the researcher changed her method on the basis of one of one what one member of um, one older adult said just blew us away we were just so impressed that she did this and and it, it did make it it did validate um, our role in in that research and that certainly has been most um most important i think and why i would take why i would choose this to spend my time on because time is always precious whether you're retired or you're not. Um, okay, so the strengths I agree we have talked about a lot and so I'll talk about some of my personal challenges um, because I think uh, and I'd like to just sort of look at two different ones. The first one is the the unknowns and the, the, the difficulty in handling that. The I'll, I'll be honest, the fear that I had when my, my my, part, my topic was chosen um, because I I have such minimal knowledge of research and of uh, and of the process, and um, I have exper good experience working with teams, but I still didn't know this team that uh, that was an unknown as well. Um, and then the role, what in the world? I, I I did know a little bit about what patient partners do because of my experience and because of some of the courses I've taken at the, with the Spore Evidence Alliance, but what in the world would I, with my limited knowledge, 
how could I possibly be patient partner co-lead uh, in this project? So it really was a, a matter of navigating uncharted territories um, without any guideposts or guidelines at all, um, <clears throat> sort of looking for uh, finding my way, looking for support from the team members, which I am very happy to say was was there and ever ever so wonderful and makes such a huge difference. And really, um, and in talking with the other two uh, teams who were uh, funded as well, and really realizing that my goal really needed to be, what can I do? What can I do to help move this project forward? And so that is what I constantly ask myself and review afterwards now, have I sent the project forward? Or have I delayed things? Um, and so I think that is that that those have been big um, issues for me. The other thing I'd like to mention, though, is the emotional overlay that patient partners bring. Now, I knew that this would be the case for people who who have family members who have been suffering from illnesses. Um, one of the patient partners, her daughter, died. Um, many people come with very um, unfortunate experiences in healthcare, as Anne has described herself as having, and I think most others have. I, on the other hand, my very personal experience was a good one. My mother in Halifax did not have to go into long-term care and was able, to my great surprise and tremendous great relief, uh, was able to have the care she needed at home. So why should I be so emotionally involved? But I am. I found I am. And so I think that those are issues that that um, patient partners and um, researchers need to be aware of, that there can be topics or there can be situations that can bring back um, difficult memories that can uh, give rise to uh, statements or behavior or, what, or to whatever um, that the patient partner can find difficult and will need help in dealing with. So those are the two areas that I want to mention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Elliot. Okay, Anne, um, uh, what would you say about what you've learned about working in this type of partnership and any other strengths you wanted to mention or challenges? Everybody is is bringing up such good points. A lot of them are, are ones that I wanted to, to touch on as well, but I, I just want to reiterate the, the validation of your research. Um, knowing that you're not the only person asking the question and you have people from the public engagement that are asking the same question, um, as you mentioned, Lori, validates what you're doing. Um, so it is informed research, and I know there's a lot of research now that is is being based on questions that people have from the public. Um, knowing uh, it's it's hard when you're when you're. I've had a lot of research experience. I've worked in in lab research. I worked in clinical research, investigator research. So I had a lot of research experience coming into this group. But I didn't have a lot of um, qualitative research experience, so I was really lucky and, and there was a lot of guidance documents that were, were given to me and there was um, examples of other studies that were similar to ours. But um, as Ellie mentioned, you, you want to find your place in what you can do and it's helpful to have roles established on what you can actually do. I know when it came to um, you know, reviewing the abstracts, I could be very helpful in that. But when it came to pulling out data from um, some of the studies and the quali qualitative studies, the guidance documents were really important to have and, and they helped me and, and I learned a lot about it. What I hope I brought is I'm, I'm very, um, I've had a lot of experience in reading over papers that have been written for editing purposes and and one of the things I found in research, and especially in, um, well, in all research, is sometimes you can write at a level that will really go over everyone's head that's reading um, the research, because if you're not actually um, educated in the field of research that you're writing on, sometimes you can forget who else may be reading the papers. And my goal was to try and read things so that anybody could, um, with the same eyes of, of somebody, who is picking up this and is saying, well, what what can I do? What changes can I make? Whether it's in a research study or in a qualitative um, 
change in the hospital. You want to be able to pull out quickly um, the information that is learned and you want to be able to apply what the information was. So those are that's the eyes that I I looked at things with um, and it was it was kind of how I felt that I could contribute. Okay, thank you, Anne. Okay, so we'll move on to Elaine. What you've learned, you've been so engaged in this work as a, in your academic position. So what have you learned about this type of partnership and the strengths and challenges of doing this? Yeah, um, it's been, um, it's interesting hearing Elliot and Anne go first, and we actually have a lot of overlap. Some of the things that I wanted to um, talk about First of all, I find it incredibly rewarding to work with um, members of the public in, in research. Um, I think it does demonstrate the importance, um, you know, having people that are, are advocates and have personal experience um, and having that passion involved in the project um, and, the, and the confidence in the, in the research process that it will uh, lead to change is uh, really motivating and also extremely humbling. Um, yeah, it, it really is um, understanding the role of research and uh, applying it to everyday lives of, in this case, people with dementia or, or people, uh, older adults with complex needs in the community. Um, so really brings the impact, the potential impact um, of the work uh, to the forefront. So I think that's that's been really um, really powerful. Um, the other thing that I think has been mostly a challenge is we're, we're involved in systematic reviews and I think it's fairly new to have um, public partners in systematic reviews in part because they're quite technical, they're, they're really uh, focused on um, pretty high level methodol methodological concepts um, so we are spending a lot of time reading research articles, um, thinking about the key words or the key concepts and how we're going to frame those, um, you know, those semantic issues. Um, a lot of deep discussion on, on, on very um, conceptual uh, pieces. Um, so not something that is um, everybody's expertise. So I think making time on the team um, to recognize that, to support um, members of the team, um, to learn different research strategies, um, methods, quality appraisal. It's been really wonderful. Both Elliot and Anne are really involved in, um, in the process of conducting the review. Um, so that's been wonderful. Um, but it is, it's, it's kind of the most research type of research you can do. It's, it's very specialized. Um, so I think that's been one of the challenges, um, for me is to, um, to recognize that, um, specialized knowledge, um, that, that some of the team members have, uh, and being able to, um, ensure that others have support to, to, um, complete the work. Um, and part of that is um, thinking about how to engage with uh, members of the public. And this is a conversation that I think, um, you know, both Elliot and I and, and Anne and I have had, um, you know, how people want to be involved, how they expect to um, communicate. All of those, those pieces are really important to think about ahead of time and to have in my mind to have really explicit conversations about that um, so that expectations are really clear up front uh, and going forward asking questions about how people want to be involved what type of support they might need um, where their expertise is um, you know whether they're interested in in disseminating some of the results at the end of the project. All of those pieces are really important, I think, to, um, to discuss at the beginning of the project and along the way as well. I just wanted to share, um, Lori and everyone, that I've had the pleasure or have the pleasure of being on um, a team with Elliot and also with Anne. And some of the things that I noticed was how good they are at 
expressing what their questions are, what they're wondering about, what their thoughts are, because their ability to do that um, is so important because you can make assumptions about what uh, partner, our, our patient partners uh, know or want to know, but when they can share as well as Anne and Elliot do, um, I believe that makes for a winning uh, combination. And uh, some, I don't, there was never a meeting that they didn't ask a question that I thought, oh, wow, what a good question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just sort of stops you because um, when you're in your researcher mode, um, thinking of years of doing research without any patient partners and how you just sort of, have a way of being and doing and uh, it's so helpful to get um, reminded okay we're here and we want to know or this is what we know and um, it, it's very refreshing and uh, adds a dimension to being part of work that um, is just great Hey, uh, thank you. Um, there's a little bit that I might add to this that um, I've just been reflecting on some of the experiences with the Voices team with the Trek program. So it's it's kind of like not nearly as engaged as Anne and um, Elliot in the systematic review, but Voices is really um, providing advice and input into an entire program of research. So often the priorities of things that we focus on really um, stem from what our citizens partners have really identified. And, you know, they're very, very candid and usually people get involved. Like it's really interesting to hear how people became engaged in this work. But I do find that people often um, are asked or volunteer to do this work because of their own personal experience. And often those experiences were challenging. So, you know, we we have many people as part of Voices who um, had negative experiences as caregivers. So maybe a parent or a spouse, it was in long-term care and they identified a lot of challenges and that really motivated them to get involved in a group that's trying to improve, you know, that environment for people. Um, and some people are not um, residents yet, but are older adults who um, have early onset dementia and anticipate might needing to be in that environment and want to change it essentially before they get there. So there's a very much an activist <laughs> component, I think, to the, the citizens who get engaged in this kind of work. And I, their their voice, <laughs> their, their voices resonate, the voices of the voices group resonates in my head a lot when they come when they're at meetings and they just really passionately talk about their experiences and and what we can do to improve things so the systematic review that i co-led with that program of research recently was really focused on um the issue of responsive behaviors or, or abusive experiences that staff experience when they work in long-term care settings you know, when you're working with people who have very high levels of dementia and pain and all manner of other physical and mental health challenges, it's a very difficult environment. I and mean, that's just one component of it, that those responsive behaviors that staff experience. But we need to, you know, and we focused on modifiable factors because you know, sure, we might learn stuff, but if we can't change it, well, that's not going to do anything. So I think the Voices group really um, helps us focus on questions that um, will make a difference and have real world applicable results. So it, as I said, that one was really, if it wasn't a modifiable factor, then we really didn't, you know, search for literature on, on those or synthesize that evidence because there's just nothing we can do about certain things. But there's other things like there's some environmental things and, you know, how staff engage with residents. There's lots of things that we did identify in that systematic review that hopefully can be used to in, improve the, the lives of staff who work there. And of course, the quality of life of residents who, who live there. So, yeah, I think it's those stories and experiences of the voices group that really forms the questions we ask. Um, 
but I must say they were not as involved as at all. As, as, um, I've just been so impressed how people like Elliot and, and Anne have been just right in there, you know, daily life. So that's, that's, this has been kind of a new experience for me and having you engaged in all of the components of the research. So that might help us think about maybe the last point on our bullet, um, our bullets here. Um, uh, how can we prepare patient and public partners and researchers for working together? Um, so both Elliot and Anne have, ex have um, you know, unique experiences and different experiences than some, than some other people in terms of your education and employment. But um, yeah, so I'm really interested to hear what you, what suggestions you have for best practices or recommendations when you put together citizens in the community and researchers. So yeah, what do you have to say about that, Elliot? Well, I think that the, I mean, I really got into this work accidentally. It was sort of part of my volunteer work. I thought it was interesting. Uh, the project was going in, in this direction. I found it more interesting than I expected. And I, I got in accidentally. And so mentorship all the way through has been very important to me because I was a clinician all my life and an advocate, not at all a researcher. So mentoring was very important. And so were several courses that I took through the Spore Evidence Alliance. Um, I bet they were invaluable courses because they were, there was, <clears throat> um, there were lectures, uh, readings, but also interactive uh, interaction as well. So it was th that those two were very, very valuable. Um, and I just, Think that those are those are the two babies. The Spore Evidence Alliance actually has very good uh, guidance tools on their website um, that uh, that you could get, easily get. One for uh, patients on um, on being a patient partner, and one for researchers and how to engage patient partners in research. And I would commend those uh, those those two as well. Okay, thank you very much. Anne, what do, what do you have to contribute around? How do we prepare people like yourself to work with researchers and any best practices or recommendations you have? Yeah, I have I have a few and, and I learned a lot being part of this group. Um, and I've learned a lot over the past on, on teams and effective teams. And one of the things that um, this group was really strong with is respectful dialogue. Um, you, they, you know the people that you're working with and you, I, I saw it all the way through from emails going back and forth, um, reviewing documents. Every member of the team would say things like, oh, fantastic work, thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, and this is to every member of the team and it was always respectful and, and sometimes I, I'll write a whole me email and, and very business minded and then I'll go back and I'll think, oh gee, all these... Uh, and then I'll say thank you. And <laughs> so this this team was really strong with with respectful dialogue, and I I appreciated that. The other thing that I think is very important is to maintain communication. Um, I find I'm the type of person that the more I'm doing, the more involved, and the more buy-in I have to the study. So um, if I feel like I'm working hard on something, I I feel really good about it. But then when you have long pauses. Um, you, you detach a little bit from the study and, and COVID threw us a real challenge and, and we, and this was one of the things that kept me engaged and kept me motivated to, to advocate for de people with dementia and their care partners was being involved in this team. It kept me, it kept me bought into the, the whole advocacy um, side of things. Um, I think it's very important to, um, yeah, to have the communication and the regular meetings and and the guidance documents and the and the roles that each person can play on the team. So I think I think that's pretty much what I'd like to add for now. Okay, great. Thank you, Anne. Um, Elaine, what would you have to add from the researcher's perspective? Yeah, well, um, I think I'd like to hear from Anne and Elliot about what are the best practices for preparing researchers to um, what advice we could give, you know, myself from two or three years ago on, on you know, what works well. Um, but, uh, you know, Anne's point about communication, I think is, is really important to have kind of as a priority in the research world. Um, you know, we're often 
you know, have really intense periods where we're applying for funding and then we have to wait to hear back from funding. So it can be months where we don't think about a project. Um, so I think something like that could, as, as Anne said, could, um, if you're not used to that, could, could be a pause that um, breaks some of the um, um, kind of the passion or the, or the um, involvement. So remembering that piece and then, you know, same thing with, um, you know, working through the review. You know, Ellie and Anne are both really involved in in the process of, you know, screening and, and um, extraction, quality appraisal. Not all public partners or, or patient partners will want to do that. So thinking about how you can engage people um, through the process um, in other ways. That can be um, a challenge, but looking at different um, pieces of literature, um, asking for input on um, how and where to disseminate findings, um, what stakeholders to engage, that type of thing. I think that can be um, a valuable way to um, engage people through a, a review. Um, but I think next time, if I, w when I'm involved in a project, is, is Something that I'll do is develop a timeline and a communication plan. <laughs> oh, I see a thumbs up from Anne. Yeah, um, yeah so just that's what I was. I was just going to to say that if for people yeah. that aren't aren't aware of all of these pauses that you can have in research, coming on to a, a research study, if you have a timeline and say, okay, this is what our study is going to involve. These are the stages. Um, would you like to be involved in each stage? And this is the time period that we have in between writing and waiting to get the first review back and answering questions and and mm -hmm. what what it's you know step by step of what's involved. Yeah. People a clear a clear view of what's going to happen and what they're getting themselves into. Yes. Yeah. So I think going going forward that would that would certainly be a piece. Um, and then understanding the resources that are available. So we connect it with um, the Maritime Spore Support Unit. So CIHR's, um, one of their uh, initiatives is the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research or SPORE. Um, and then the local um, support group is the MSSU support group, um, support for, for people engaging in patient-oriented research. Um, but they have classes or, or workshops for, um, people who are interested in being patient partners or, or public partners. So I think encouraging people to connect with that type of unit um, to learn a little bit about the, the process and expectations in general about patient engagement. Um, and then kind of more of the nitty gritty. We're obviously using JBI methods for our review, so pointing them to the JBI wiki or just having the tools that we're using um, available and sent out to the team and any um, like background information about how to use them. A lot of the tools have, um, for example, the quality appraisal tools has, you know, lots of information about uh, the studies and what each of the quality appraisal items means. Um, so we went through some of those together as a team. Um, to talk about, you know, what we'd be looking for in different types of research. So, so understanding what resources are available, and those are kind of two that that worked well for um, for our projects, I think. Wonderful. Okay, I would just say it's up all about time. Some of you alluded to issues of time. Like I think it's people outside of academia the timelines we work with are insane like when you think about how long it can take to answer a question um it, so i think just sort of explaining the steps the stages we go through and now there's been a lot of work done in maryland's led some rapid reviews and that's a, a quite a different experience of being able to go through systematic review processes quicker but sort of a traditional jbi review takes a very long time and <laughs> i think just making sure everyone is aware of, of all of those pieces um the, yeah at the beginning and just uh, i think it's all about there's lots of other things but i think the time piece is really important we have just a couple minutes so 
Did anyone have any final comments or thoughts um, that they would like to bring up? We have, yes, um, Anne. Um, I just want to mention the institutional barriers that you can have as well, where I wasn't a member of DAL, I couldn't get access to some of the shared files. So, um, you know, work within the institution itself to make it easier for public patient or public um, engagement to be on board in the study is, is an area of that needs attention too. Yeah, thank you for that, Anne. That's really important. Um, so we do have um, uh, honorariums for our patient partners in accordance with um, uh, best practices. Um, in terms of institutional affiliation, that, that has been a challenge. So accessing full text of, of articles through uh, the library, um, using things like summary, um, or even uh, Covidence, which is a software we use for um, screening, there can be challenges to um, to using those. So uh, absolutely work to do uh, at the institution level to normalize and uh, enable public partners in research. And I have to, and just listening, all of a sudden it, it struck me that certainly in terms of summary, I've had a conversation with JBI, but um, uh, it reminds me that it's probably a good idea to have a more fulsome conversation around uh, patient partners and, you know, at least the, the conversation about barriers. And I can't imagine that other entities around the world haven't faced the same uh, challenges. So there could well be workarounds that maybe other centers are using that um, I don't know about. And so uh, thanks for bringing that up. Well, I think we're we're at time. I, um, I wanted to thank everyone for participating and for this really, really interesting discussion. Marilyn, did you want to close us off here? Uh, you're doing just fine, Lori, so I'm happy for you to continue. <laughs> okay, well, I just wanted to thank you and thank you for participating in this event. And it's always interesting to engage on these kinds of issues. And, you know, I've just been so impressed how um, Elaine has engaged so many people with all of the different components of doing this. And it's just been a pleasure to work with people like Anne and um, and Elliot in, in going through this process. And thank you, Kelly, for attending. <laughs> um, we will, this will be recorded and hopefully other people will be able to access um, the recording as well later on. So thank you all so much for your time today and um, have a great day, everyone. Mm -hmm.